Well, hey, good morning, everybody. It's, it's good to be here. That was so awesome to uh, just worship God. Wow. Uh, he's good. He's worthy. And he's here in this building. And he's also there wherever you are, at your campsite maybe, or in your living room. I really believe that, that God wants to knit our hearts together and have the spirit of unity over GMC. And it's, it's going to be a great Great morning, and hopefully this is going to be our last online-only service for a very long time. That would be very cool, because next week we're going to be starting drive-in services. We're still going to continue to stream uh, Sundays at 10 a.m., and so you can tune in online, but we'd really encourage you to come to the drive-in service, and just because you drive in, you're, you're still able to get out of your vehicle, and uh, so you'll want to bring a lawn chair. I think it's going to be a really great time. We're going to have... I think coffee and water bottles and maybe co- cookies. Are there cookies? I've heard there's cookies. So it's going to be good. We're really looking forward to having you back. It's going to be something really cool, uh, to, uh, a cool way to worship God outside uh, during the summer. Right on. So let's, yeah, before we get into the word this morning, let's pray. Father, you're good and you're faithful and you're awesome, Lord. And we just ask that you would move in a powerful way Lord God, um, and we just want to magnify you this morning, Father. As we as we dive into your word, may you be magnified, but may you be glorified, and and may uh, we just really see how beautiful and how awesome you are in your scriptures, God. That they would just come to life in our heart. Um, You would just, um, yeah, really speak to us personally, Lord God, in the scriptures this morning. Amen. Right on. So we're continuing our uh, summers, Summer in the Psalms series. Uh, it's a really enjoyable series. I have a lot of fun actually preparing a sermon that would be an exegetical sermon kind of going through Scripture. And that's, that's a really cool way uh, to, to preach. It's really cool to, to pick a topic. I think that's just as biblical uh, when you pick a topic and, and you kind of bounce all around getting the whole counsel of Scripture. But it's also really cool to zone in on, on one psalm and really dive in deep. So it really blessed, blessed me. This psalm really blessed me over the week as I, I dove into it, and I really hope that it's going to bless you as well. It's going to be Psalms 22, so if you want to turn there, uh, it will also probably be on the, the screen right here, maybe. I don't know. But Psalms 22, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So so this is the cry of Jesus on the cross, right? And I also believe that this was probably the cry of, of David as well. And some scholars will say some different things about this. Some scholars will say this, is, uh, this was only David's prayer. Psalms 22 is David's prayer, but Jesus just quoted it. Um, but as we go through Psalms 22, we're going to see so many references that point to Jesus and the cross. Other, other um, scholars will say this, was only, this only pertains to Jesus. I really think that it probably pertains to both. If we look at this psalm, I think there's so many situations that David went through that would pertain to this psalm and this psalm would be relevant too. So I think this was a genuine cry of David's heart. And also at the same time, this, was, this acted as a, a prophetic psalm telling of what was to come. And that's the beautiful thing about scripture, right? It's so multi-dimensional. I think it was David's prayer and ended up, many parts of it ended up being Jesus' prayer. And then also I think we're invited for it to become, you know, our, our prayer as well. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me so far from my cries of anguish. So you just see pain in David. My God, I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer by night. I find no rest. And the Psalms are, are very raw, right? I think we're discovering that more and more, and I'm discovering that more and more. They're so raw. You read them and you're like, are you allowed to say that? Is, is that legal to say to God that, that he feels far away and that you're, you're not being answered by him. But yes, it is. It is legal to say that because this was David's emotion that he was expressing to God, right? And so the Psalms, in a beautiful way, they, they show us and invite us how we can pray through our emotion. We can pray through our pain. 
um, and we can pray through our doubt. And so David in this prayer is, a, is a, a prayer as he's feeling God being distant. And, and sometimes I think uh, we've all felt this way, right? Uh, last week, Brian preached an awesome message about experiencing the presence of God and hungering and thirsting to experience God. That's in no way contradictory to this psalm. Right? Because that is the cry of our hearts, and, and we do need to press into his presence, and, and there's pre- pleasures at his right hand evermore, right? And so we want to hunger and thirst for the, for the presence of God, and yet at the same time, there can be a season in our life where it's just like, ah, oh, I'm trying that, or just, it just feels like, you ever feel like you're praying and there's just a wall, you know, there's a wall and it's not getting to heaven, that's what it feels like. Right? And so I think David's in a situation where, where he's feeling this. He's feeling like, God, it's just like you're not there. It's just like you're not answering. And again, at the same time, David has had awesome encounters with God and, and presses into his presence. But right now, he's, he's feeling this way. Um, I, I've felt this way before. And, and the scary reality of it is that it can feel so real, right? When, when we're going through something like this, none of it's true, it's not true that God's distant. It's not true that God's far away. It's not true that there's a wall that's stopping your prayers, but it can feel very real, right? And so this is, this is the, the, the hard, hard thing is that feelings can feel real, and it's in this state that it's so important that I be faithful despite my feelings, Right? When my feelings are not lining up with actually reality and, and the truth of God and his faithfulness and that he is there and that he does hear my, my cries, it's really important that I'm faithful in spite of my feelings. Right? And, and so David, what does he do to do that? What does he do? I think he does something amazing to be faithful in spite of feeling this way. Look what he does. He focuses on a greater truth and he focuses on, it's, it's almost like he's zoning in on his misery, but then he zones out to see the big picture. Because look at this transition, verse 3. Yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. Isn't that so cool? Is that cool? I want to hear you from your home. Is that cool? I think that's so cool. God, you're distant, you're far away, you don't even hear me. But yet, you're on your throne. You are on your throne. You're enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. And he's recalling God's faithfulness, the stories of faithfulness that he's heard, how God delivered his ancestors. To you, they cried out and they were saved. Right? He's looking at the resume of God. He's saying, God, like you, you are amazing. You are faithful. And, and, and when we read our Bible, we can see the resume of God's faithfulness, right? It's there time and time and time again. As people often aren't faithful, God remains faithful to his covenant and faithful to his people. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and they were not put to shame. And I just think that's so incredibly powerful, this yet is, is amazing because David, he's, he, zones, he zooms out to see his complete picture. And that's important. When we're in pain, when we're in a state of misery, can we zoom out, out of our misery? It's not that we have to ignore it. That would be going to an extreme that we don't want to go to. No, we acknowledge how we're feeling. But can we zoom out to see a greater picture of what's happening, right? Because or else we're not really going to get the true picture of what's going on, are we? we just zone in really close. It would be going like, it would be like going to an art gallery and the only art that you look at is from an inch away. You're just right up to the art and like, okay, that's pretty cool. And you're just trying to scan, you know, that, that, that piece of art. It's so hard to get actually what, what the, what the picture and the artist is meant to say, right? You want to get that feel for, for, that, pi- that piece of art. And right now, me and Valerie are watching a, a show where they're, uh, they're going to Airbnbs and they're very artsy people. It's kind of funny. It's like, oh, this makes me feel like this. You know, they, they try to get the feel for the house and, and, and they're getting that big picture and that big feel. And that's really important. Uh, me and Valerie also bought a house in, in Morden. So we're going to be moving this summer. And when we bought the house, 
maybe it's important to zoom in, you know, but, but it, would be really, it would be really tough to get a gauge of a house if all you looked at was, you looked at the house with binoculars on. Constantly, you're just walking around, oh, this is a nice house. Oh, look at that paint. Wow, look at that cabinet. Okay, kind of a nice house, but it's disjointed and you're not actually seeing the full picture, right? You're, you're just getting little pieces and, and, and it's hard for you to put that together. And, and I think this is the challenge in, in all, when we're in a state of, man, God feels distant, can we zoom out? Can we still see the big picture? Uh, I, I read this in, in an article this week in, out of psych, Psychology Today, and I love when psychology often um, fits in with the, with the Word of God. It's pretty cool. It's by Rick Hansen. The article is called Seeing the Big Picture, and the subtitle is The Brain's Negativity Bias Can Make Us Lose Sight of the Whole. And I'm just going to read just a, just a snapshot of what it says. Our nervous system has what's called often a negativity bias that routinely scans for bad news. So in our nervous system, it's like scanning, 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 scanning. You know, is there a bear? Is there, you know, it's scanning for bad news. Then the brain fixates upon it with tunnel vision. Isn't that really true? Right, when there's bad news, we can fixate on it like, I see the bad news, and that's all I'm seeing right now. This may aid in immediate survival. If it's a bear, that's good that I'm zoning in on the bear, right? Because that's a problem. This may aid in immediate survival, but not long-term well-being and healthy relationships. To counter this tendency, lift up your gaze to include more of what's around you, then all the way up to the horizon line. This activates neural circuits that are holistic and inclusive, not locked into, narrow, uh, not locked into a narrow, self-centered point of reference. Wow, that's powerful, right? Because it's, it's in that state of I'm, I'm, I'm tunneling vision on bad news that I don't see the big picture and I'm locked into the self-centered point of re- reference and, and all of a sudden I'm not seeing the big picture. I'm not seeing the scope of God and eternity and his faithfulness and, and all of these things. And now, this is so cool. Or imagine that you're seeing your home work, relationships, organization, nation, or world from a bird's eye point of view? What looks different from this panoramic perspective? That's cool. I'm gonna gonna change this a little bit. I'm gonna make this biblical. Imagine that you're seeing your home, work, relationships, organization, nation, world from a kingdom point of view. What's different from this panoramic perspective? That's awesome. And you know, it reminds me of of that story in Genesis 15 where where Abraham's in the tent and God's renewing his covenant to Abraham and, and God ends up saying, or Abram at the time, and God ends up saying, hey, get out of the tent. Get out of the tent and look up to the stars. Right now, your present reality looks pretty bleak. Because I've, I've promised you that you're going to be a father of many nations and it's really confusing for you because you don't have a kid and you're super old and your wife is super old and none of this makes any sense. But get out of the tent and go see the star. See this, this big picture and see what I'm doing here, Abram, because it's probably hard for you to have faith right now. And I think God invites us and I think we are called to see the big picture when we're in our misery. But at the same time, David still has more to work through, right? It's not that we just zoom out, that all of a sudden everything is just like, oh, oh it's, it's, not, it's not hard to walk through my pain anymore. No, there's still, there's still wrestling that David has to do. So, so this is what he says, but I am a, a worm and not a man. And I just want to take a moment to actually zone in on that word worm. Is, this is actually a word... Uh, a Hebrew word for crimson worm. And I'm going to read to you a little bit about the crimson worm. It's pretty amazing. When it's time for the, the female crimson worm to have babies, she finds the trunk of a tree. Then she attaches her body to that wood and makes a hard crimson shell. The crimson worm then lays eggs under her body and the protective shell. When the baby worms hatch, they stay under the shell. 
So, so not only does the mother give protection for her babies, but it also provides them with food. The babies feed on the living body of the mother. Just after, after just a few days, when the young worms grow to the point that they're able to take care of themselves, the mother dies. As the mother crimson worm dies, a crimson red dye is left that stains the wood and also is permanently stained on her young children and they're colored scarlet red for the rest of their lives. After three days, the dead mother's worm body loses its crimson colors and turns into a white wax which falls to the ground like snow. That's pretty nuts. <laughs> like, I was like, whoa! Unbelievable. And, and so David here is feeling like this worm, right? I, I don't think he was really tracking into this crimson worm, this beautiful poetry. I think he's just like, I feel like a worm. I don't even feel human. But it's amazing because Jesus was going to be the, the mother crimson worm, right? Who was going to protect us, save us, and we were going to be colored with his blood forever. Unreal. The Bible is so, so cool. But I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. And this is, this is really so, so close to what, what Jesus was going through on the cross as well, right? Jesus was mocked and ridiculed. We see in Matthew 27, he trust, they, they said to Jesus, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Again, this is almost word for word here. Isaiah 53 verse 3, a, a prophetic word about Jesus also says he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. That's a, uh, that's a, that's, I think this is a concept that we know, right? I, I think we know that Jesus I- experienced pain. But when I currently pray to Jesus, sometimes there's almost a disconnect that he walked through what I walked through. That he walked through pain. Sometimes because, because Jesus is enthroned in heaven, right? So it, it feels like I am, yeah, I'm, I'm praying to this holy and awesome God. And you are. But, but he walked through what you walked through. He came down to earth, right? And so I love what it says in Hebrews 4. This high priest of ours, right? He's, he's our interceder, this high priest of ours, understands our weaknesses. Isn't that wild? And, and I think that's so cool when, when you're going through a struggle and, and there's a friend around you who has been through that same struggle, right? There's a sense of, of comfort there. Well, whatever we're going through, remember, we have to remember when, when we're praying to Jesus, we can't say, you don't know what this feels like because actually Jesus does. He understands it. He actually, this is just so cool. He actually gets it. He's like, I know. I walked through hardship. I was despised. I was rejected. And I was killed. I actually had it way worse than you, (laughs) right? I don't know if he'll say that, but that's the truth. For he faced all of the same testings we do. Wow, do 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 I keep that in mind as I'm praying to Jesus? Wow, actually, Jesus, you get this. You actually get this state of of feeling this way because you were a human. I I know that in my head, but sometimes in my own prayer life, there's almost a disconnect there that that Jesus doesn't truly get how I'm feeling, but yet he does. And then it says, yet he did not sin. Right, so he went through the same testings and then he passed the test, became sin that I might become right with him. And we're going to continue to talk about the significance of Jesus uh, in this chapter as we go forward, but we're going we're gonna to kind of continue now. So David, I, again, he, he zooms kind of in back on his misery. I feel like a worm. I feel less than human. People are making fun of me and mocking me and despising me. And then again, he has that powerful word, yet. Yet, you brought me out of the womb. So David is kind of, he, there's this wild thought in his head. He's like, I don't feel human. 
I just feel like this, this little worm that's squiggling around in the dirt, just eating dirt all day. That's what I feel like. And now he's saying, but yet, I am a human. <laughs> you brought me out of my mother's womb. I'm made by you. I'm significant by you. I'm not a worm. God, I feel like a worm, but you brought me out of the womb. And you made me trust in you. Even at my mother's breast, from birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. And so now what he's doing is he's addressing that those, um, first of all, he's addressing the lie, I'm a worm, with the truth that he's not a worm. And now he's addressing everyone that's, that's casting doubt on his trust in God and making fun of his trust in God. And he's saying, you know what, God, it's you. You made me trust in you. you. You have really shaped my whole life and you've helped me. You've brought me to a trust in you. This trust isn't feeble and fickle. It's, it's rooted in, in who you are and it's rooted in your love and grace that you revealed to me and I responded to. So it's just so cool, right? So David, he has these lies and this misery going on. He keeps combating it with truth. Just kind of like Jesus as he was in the, the desert with, with the, the devil, Right? The, the devil throws lies at him, and Jesus comes at him with, with the scripture and truth. So David's combating these, these feelings and these struggles and these emotions that are real, and he's going through with truth. And now David kind of moves into a petition and a request from God. So this is his request. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there's no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey open, um, mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax, it is melted within me. My mo- mouth is dried up and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. This is um, just like Jesus as he was on the cross saying he was thirsty. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and feet, which is obviously this, this um, it, it's obviously talking about crucifixion as well, which is wild because crucifixion wasn't a thing when David was writing this, a thousand years before Christ. It was the execution of the, the Romans that did crucifixion. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Again, this is what they did to Jesus. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. So David, again, he, he was talking, he was addressing his emotions. He was zooming out to see the truth of God. He addresses his emotions, zooms out to see the truth of God, and now he's really just petitioning God, this is what I'm asking. This is what I'm needing you. I'm needing you to rescue me. And now there's this final wild transition into all out praise. It's really amazing. Verse 22 says, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. Those who fear the Lord, praise him. So David makes this final transition into, I'm gonna praise God, and I'm not keeping that to myself. I'm gonna praise God in front of the assembly, in front of the people, all the people who fear the Lord, Let's praise him. Again, he doesn't even keep it to himself. It's like, let's start praising God. And I think that's just so cool because I think David, I think there's a reality that he's still in his pain at this point, right? He's still in his, his time of, of, of hardship and suffering, but you can praise right in your pain, right? You can praise right in it. And so now he's bringing everyone into this praise party as well, right? He's not alone in a room praising God. He's like, this has got to be big. (laughs) All you descendants of Jacob, honor him, revere him. All you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry of help. So again, he's telling the truth. It may feel like God doesn't hear my prayer, but actually the truth is he listens to me and I'm not despised or scorned by God. He feels feels like he's forsaken, right? But he's not forsaken. 
From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly before those who fear you. I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. To those who seek God, the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. So this is getting to be just this, he's zooming way out to just say, man, there's gonna be everyone praising God. It's gonna be amazing. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship, the rich and the poor. All who go down to the dust or die will kneel before him. Those who can't keep themselves alive Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to people yet unborn, he has done it. And that sounds so familiar, doesn't it? It is finished. He's, he's zooming out to just span just the wild party it's going to be of everyone praising God. Right, Every knee bowing before the Lord. And he's seeing the ultimate picture of, of God's victory. And I think that's so important. While we're here on earth and while we're going through things, can we see the ultimate picture of God's victory? Right, And sometimes that's very hard. It's very hard to see the ultimate picture of God's victory because I have negativity bias and I'm zoned in on what I'm going through but I need to zoom out to see the picture of victory. I have to realize that he has done it. He's done it. He won. We know the end, right? My my wife does this wild thing when she's going through a a TV show, and and TV shows or or movies, they always get you, right? Because the hero just gets into this predicament, and they they almost trick you into being like, there's no way. There's no way they can get out of this. There's no way the end could be happy. This is not going to turn out good, right? They kind of trick you and that that suspense arises and you're like, oh, what's going to happen? Even though you know what's going to happen, right? What Valerie often does if it's a long TV show and there's suspense is she'll just watch the ending. (laughs) She'll be like, oh, okay, that's that's what happens. Cool, now now I know. Now I can watch the rest and I can be relaxed. Don't worry, it's all... It's all going to be fine. It's all going to work out in the end. <laughs> and I think we get this awesome advantage that, that, that we know Christ won the victory. Right? We, we know the end. It, it might look bleak. It might look like there's no way out. It might look in, in my present moment that things are, oh man, what's going on to my life and my world and my relationships? God, we're losing the battle. But no, can we zoom out and see that there's overwhelming victory, right? And so Psalms 22, just, to, just kind of to, to wrap things up slowly here, Psalms 22 is this amazing prayer through our times of pain, our times of doubt, and our times of suffering. And what it does is it's real about our feelings. It, it, it's, David does, does not just say, I feel great right now. No, he says, I feel like a worm I feel like you're far away. This is what I'm feeling like. But constantly, David ends up zooming out and saying, but there's bigger stuff going on here. I have to see that God's enthroned. I have to see that, that, that generations are going to worship God. I have to see that he's actually won the victory, that he has actually done it. And I think Psalms 22, on an even more important level, was the prayer of, of Jesus on the cross, right? He entered our, our, our pain and suffering. He entered that. And he was despised, rejected, and mocked. And on the cross, he prayed this, this prayer of David, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and this is a bit of a, a mystery, and I, I don't even really pretend to understand what was happening in that moment, but, but what, what was happening in that moment is, is Jesus was taking on the sin of the world, right? He who knew no sin, when you don't know any sin, you know God, right? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So Jesus, who had this perfect relationship with the Father, and he had never, ever sinned, 
is now becoming sin. He's taking on all that, that yuck and the sin that, that, that ended up, you know, separating mankind from God, right? It was that, that sin in the garden that, that uh, brought Adam and Eve out of the, 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 the presence of God. And so he's taking on this sin and there's this, this sense, I don't know if there's this, this human sense of distance. It wasn't that Jesus was removed from the Trinity. Absolutely not. He was part of God, right? But there was this sense of, of distance and separation as he was becoming sin. But because he did it, because he finished it, we can now rejoice in our suffering and in our feeling of separation from God because he won the victory. He experienced that moment so I can be brought near to God. So I'm not separated from the presence of God. Even maybe when I feel like that and I feel like God's distant, it's not true. Because if I've become a a, a Christian, if I've given my life to God, he's brought you near. There's nothing separating you from the love of God. I just want to finish with this passage in Romans 8. I think it just ties perfectly into this. Romans 8 says this, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? So what's that talking about? I'm going to skip reading it. But Romans 8 is talking about the glorification. Talking about the sons and daughters being glorified and revealed. The earth, which is groaning, is going to be glorified. And it's going to be, wow, it's it's talking about the the coming of the, the kingdom to earth, right? And creation restored and the sons and daughters glorified. So what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God's for us, who can ever be against us? What's that answer? No one. Since he did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own. And what's that answer? No one. No one can accuse us. It falls flat because God has chosen us. So if God has chosen us, you can't accuse me. Who then, for for God himself is sitting at the right hand, standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. Despite what, what, anyone says we're not condemned if we're in Christ Jesus, right? No one, for Christ Jesus has died for us and was raised to life for us and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. So he's interceding on our behalf, right? And this is why we're, we're justified and made right with God. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? This is such a What a powerful question. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? But look what it says. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? That's powerful. Right? The early church is going through all of these things. This is a reality for them. And in that reality, it, it, it can probably be sure easy to feel like, God, you don't love me. Clearly you don't. Because I'm going through this. But Paul is saying, does it mean he no longer loves us if we go through these things? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. The answer is No despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Wow. Despite all of those things, there's overwhelming victory. And that, that's so hard to see, right? When you're in that, that state of, of pain and hardship, there's overwhelming victory. To remember, man, there's actually overwhelming victory in Christ Jesus our Lord. But we know that there is because he's done it, right? He's finished it. 
So now he says, I'm convinced. I'm convinced that nothing will ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, angels nor demon, neither our fears today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love, no power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can we give him a whoop whoop? Yeah. Amazing. Let's pray. Yeah, God, I, I just thank you so much that you did it. Just like it reads at the end of this psalm, you did it. It is finished, God. And so, God, I, I, I just pray that that whatever situation we're in today or will be in tomorrow or next year, there's gonna be, there is gonna be times of hardship. There is gonna be times where you feel distant, where we cry out to you and it feels like there's nothing happening. But God, I, I just pray that you would just give us the strength and help us to be faithful in spite of our feelings and help us just to zoom out and see the scope and the grandeur of the victory that you won. And we can then just join in this great rejoicing that you are good and then the party starts now because you did it. You won. No matter what it feels like in my life right now, you won. And we can start partying right now. Even though we're down 3-0 in the series, <laughs> We can rejoice like we won the Stanley Cup today because you did it, God. And we know you did. We know you did. And we thank you for doing that, God. We thank you for winning the victory through Christ Jesus. Thank you that now we're not condemned. We're not distant from you. If we accept Jesus, if we accept Jesus, we don't have to be distanced from you because you paid for the penalty of our sin. And anyone listening right now, if, if, if you've never accepted Jesus into your heart, I encourage you, uh, it, it's, it's an easy thing to do. It's not about saying the right words. It's, it's about acknowledging that I believe that Jesus did die for my sin. I believe that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to confess that I have fallen short and I want to confess that you are the Lord of my life. When you do that with, with your heart and with your mouth, there's, there's this divine thing that happens where, where the, the, the Holy Spirit makes you his and in habitat, and it, it, he comes in. And there's not this separation. And nothing can separate you from the love of God again. Yeah, so God, we praise you for that. We praise you for the victory. Amen. Can I throw a curveball on you? Can you sing the Christ over everything song? Sure. Because that was just so fitting. So sorry. But let's do it. Let's praise Christ.
resurrected King in one moment. He brought death to his knees, all the power of and all authority to one name over everything. Yes, God. One name over everything. Jesus. Oh consuming amazing presence of God would walk with you this week and as you as you surrender to him he will absolutely do that we pray a blessing upon you we invite you to reach out if there's any needs in your life